Welcome to Leadership Starts on the Inside, a Lead Like Jesus podcast. Hello, welcome to the Lead Like Jesus podcast, where leadership starts on the inside. My name is Rich Cummins, and I'm your host of today's episode. Joining me today is a good friend of the movement, Oleg Vasilevsky. He's joining us from the Ukraine, and we really want to really dive into what's going on there, find out from Oleg how we as a movement can help our brothers and sisters right now in Ukraine. So Oleg, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you. Well, certainly our hearts go out to you and your brothers and sisters in Ukraine, and we just want to see what's going on and how we can help. But before we start there, let's just dive into your experience with Lead Like Jesus. You've been a partner of ours for over five years. Can you briefly tell our listeners what your partnership has been like with Lead Like Jesus and why you believe that leading like Jesus leadership as a model is what you believe Ukraine needed at the moment? Um, my wife and I founded Reduga Ministries in 94. And um, we were, in 94, we started running camps. Um, and then our camps, in fact, we were not going to run camps for children. We we're going to run camps for, uh, we were part of University Christian Fellowship. And we we're really re organizing camps, more of a kind of uh, leadership training uh, for university students. And we just needed kids for an experiment. And so, um, so that's how we started doing our camps. And that was actually what we didn't, what we hadn't realized is that uh, we got ourselves into uh, training ministry more than camp ministry because once you train your leaders, then your leaders lead others. So it was all about uh, it was all about leadership. And only one summer uh, since 1994, we we didn't run camps. And during that summer, um, we were invited to come and um, and train um, and train churches in in, le in that leadership program that we developed for our counselors, which actually, you know, one of the reasons why our camps, uh, you know, were so successful. And, and so we, we train them in DISC, we train them in uh, uh, Strength Finder, we train them in DISC. So one of the hardest things to find in ministry world is not a theoretical leadership training, but experiential leadership training. And when we, uh, we were at Camp Blanchard's office in San Diego, uh, we were, my wife and I were, uh, were trained as, as uh, uh, trainers in, in um, situational leadership. And they said, hey, you really need to check out this thing called Lead Like Jesus. And so when we, um, when um, Jim Montgomery flew to Ukraine to do training for us. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so awesome. Somebody has actually developed experiential leadership training, not just sitting, you know, in a lecture and something that touches you, something that has activities and something that is also so structured that you can actually remember four words. Um, and, and yeah, we we're, my wife and I being um, uh, educators, uh, we, we're we're, we're educators by training, you know, we immediately uh, became raving fans of Lead Like Jesus and started doing that for the churches, started doing that for our staff, started doing that for different denominations in Ukraine. What they've, you know, what they've done for us with such, teaching us situation leadership and with, uh, you know, with Lead Like Jesus, uh, car, uh, joy, uh, journey of a carpenter, you know, it's, uh, all of that is used here. It just kind of, it kind of, you know, it, it, it becomes that tool because as you, as we work with volunteers, as we work with people who've never done warehouse management, for instance, you know, they were doing something else, you know, they were opera singers or something, you know, and now they do this, they all go through the stages and it, or, or explaining people disc, you know, just it, it, it because, because there are so many things change so quickly Plus, you add the whole emotional factor to that, right? And so, conflicts can arise. If you want, if you want to be screaming, running, and screaming around, you can do that. There are there are enough reasons to do that. There are not plenty of triggers to do that. Or if you understand, you know, what stage you go through and what what is your temperament, then uh, then you can work in in a much better unity. And and that has definitely been used. And we're very thankful for that. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And. Uh... You know, that reminds me that vision has the two parts. It's our leadership. It has the vision part and then implementation. And so being able to actually walk it out and live it out has been important to you. That's what, that's what I'm hearing you say. And so Oleg, 
before we talk about the current situation, would love to understand more about the Ukrainian people, about your culture, and anything else that you would be helpful for our audience to know. Mm -hmm. um, Ukraine, Ukraine is an interesting country in multiple perspectives. Uh, both in the spiritual perspective and uh, geopolitical perspective. Ukraine, uh, it, it, it so happened that Ukraine um, has never been an empire. We, we, we were never an empire. And so we never had imperialistic ambitions. Let's go conquer more land. You know, let's, let's become bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, at, and at the same time, we also never, in the past, uh, I think in the past uh, thousand years or so, we didn't have a king. So it was it was always run by you know it was always run by different um, different dukes of different regions, but we never really had a king who would you know kind of uh, lead the whole the whole country, and um, and so in in that sense, like for instance, uh, you know on the western part we had Rech Pospolita, which was an alliance of uh, Poland and Lithuania, and that was an empire. And of course, you know on the north on the northern side we had Russia. And then on the southwestern uh, part, we had Hun Hungarian Austrian Empire. So there are all these empires around Ukraine, and Ukraine was kind of in the middle. And Ukraine has always been peaceful. It's like, you know, we don't need your land, just don't touch us. Let, let us live peacefully. In fact, our flag uh, reflects that. Our flag has um, um, our flag has a sky and also it has wheat field on the bottom. And that's what that's what, you know, we're we just want to ha live happy lives. So that's that's one part. And then uh, on the spiritual side, Ukraine, um, again, on the country to our neighbors, um, Ukraine does not have a religious monopoly. If you read uh, about Hitler and the story of, of his ascension to power, one of the things you're going to find is how Hitler tried to uh, privatize, if you will, uh, create a pocket church. And he wasn't successful the first time uh, there. I'm not sure it was, was a syn synod or, a, you know, that... that um, that gathering of churches, of church leaders in Germany voted against Hitler. And then he was, after persecution and everything, he, did, he made it possible second time, um, and pr persecution. And uh, in, in Ukraine, you know, in Russia, something very similar ha happened. Uh, you know, Putin created a pocket church. In fact, it's a terrorist organization. Many in Ukraine is, a, it, I think, very, very soon going to pass that law. But for people in, of Ukraine, Russian Orthodox Church is a terrorist organization. And there are multiple cases how Orthodox priests uh, bo both uh, both uh, did propaganda, including military action as well. They're involved in military action. Um, point uh, showing to Russian military where what what buildings they had to hit in Ukraine. So and then at the same time in Poland, you know, religious monopoly. Cat, uh, Catholic Church has a religious monopoly in Poland, and Ukraine was actually never had that uh, that the state church. You know, we have Russian Orthodox, we have Ukrainian Orthodox, we have lots of evangelical. Well, not lots, not really lots. Two percent of Ukraine are evangelicals, but it's higher than Poland. It's higher than Russia. Uh, higher than Hungary, and then uh, and then you know so so we live we've been living in a relatively um, free religious uh, environment. So if evangelicals wanted to hold uh, a big Thanksgiving uh, celebration, a hundred thousand Ukrainians would come downtown, and we would and also despite despite uh, despite all the Soviet propaganda that evangelical church was a cult and despite all the orthodox propaganda which of course was coming from russia you know despite all of that ukrainian church has really been doing you know all the evangelistic events that we wanted to do we could do camps openly we didn't have to mm -hmm. fight to do to hide and uh and i think that created a lot of uh ground for us to um to grow to grow christian movement so oleg Currently, as, as we all know, you're in the midst of a terrible tragedy. You have war going on all around you, and you've been on the ground since day one, since day one. What would be the most pressing and urgent needs right now in Ukraine? Um, there are, well, I mean, the answer is very simple. It's uh, food and hygiene products. Very, very simple. Um, our infrastructure has been uh, has been destroyed. You you watch, I'm sure CNN and other uh, channels. That, I mean, you know, like yesterday uh, yesterday a uh, a theater 
was bombed in Mariupol. And uh, I mean, why would you bomb a theater? How, what kind of a military uh, object is, is a theater? So Russia has been just wiping out uh, uh, buildings. Uh, my former staff's uh, sister was killed in her apartment after one of the missiles hurt, uh, hit her, bil- her multi-story bil- residential building. It, was, it just happened two days ago. She, sent us, she, she, she said, please pray for me because I'm like, I, I, I don't have words about what happened. And so, uh, and so what happened as a result of infrastructure being destroyed, as a result of uh, you know, economy being, being destroyed, we're dealing with two situations. We're dealing with situations where it's hard to deliver some food to different, also there are, there are a few besieged cities in Ukraine. And so it's hard for us to deliver food there um, and, uh, and stores are run out of, of food. Uh, and then also we're dealing with people not having money. So yeah. because they've lost jobs and, you know, 3 million people, probably at least 3 million people left the country. That's almost 10% of our population. They, they fled the country. And, and that's not to mention the number of internally displaced people who were serving here in Western Ukraine. Uh, so, yeah, so we, that's, that's what we're dealing with right now. And, and that shortage and those shortages will probably increase as Ukraine, um, as Ukraine is probably going to miss its uh, its um, uh, agricultural season, its harvest season, uh, some people say it's going to take a year and a half to demine the country after all the mines that Russians are leaving in you know every, all over all over the country. So I think that you know we're here in this game for the long haul, helping people of Ukraine survive for the next at least year and a half until we have you know upcoming harvest. And again, you know, as I'm as I'm saying this, you know, there is a big uh, asterisk to say that it, if if this war would have ended today, and we, we mm. don't know what you know how it's all going to end. Well, you mentioned refugees and those displaced, and and I think in a in a recent update on Facebook, you might have mentioned eleven thousand uh, folks in your area that the churches have been coming along to support. And what other ways have you seen the body of Christ in Ukraine activate to come alongside each other and help each other through these tragedies? Yeah, sometimes I feel like Body of Christ was really more created for the crises than for the regular life. You know, it's just every all Christians unite, churches become uh, centers of distribution of humanitarian aid, churches become places where people can can hide. It's uh, it's amazing how everybody got united. There are lots of um, there are lots of Christians who joined army. There are lots of Christians who joined territorial defense. Um, I think one of the difficulties that that we we dealt with, this is kind of a side note, is that um, Ukrainian Protestant church was brought up in the spirit of pacifism, which is not biblical, um, and and today's events prove that it's not biblical. And and I think that's why Europe is so slow in helping Ukraine, United States much quicker in helping Ukraine, but still slow. And, Mm -hmm. And, you know, after signing... Budapest memorandum, United States should have jumped into Ukraine in 2014, which it, 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 it didn't happen in Europe too. So Ukraine does feel betrayed uh, by, by the Western world. And, uh, and so people felt, you know, hey, we're, this is our country, we need to protect. And um, the, the word says, thou shall not kill, but the word, the word doesn't say thou sh- you, uh, shall not protect you know, we're not, we don't need a piece, we don't need an inch of Russian land. We just want to protect our homes. We want to protect our cities. And so, yeah, that's what people were doing. Some, you know, people have weapons and people have food. And that's what, for our, just, you know, kind of, we're, we're running this humanitarian center here. It's called Spirit of Victory. And the way how I encourage myself, I say, hey, our government pays $300 for each detained Russian occupant. And our government pays $10,000 for each uh, shot tank. So every every uh, $300 we raise here for humanitarian aid is going to save our government $300 to pay for guns and to pay our soldiers and and to buy more ammunition. So, you know, this is what we're going to do. Every $10,000 we raise, is, is this is how we, we, we help our government as well to do what they need to do to protect our houses and our land. So obviously, there are many of us all around the globe your brothers and sisters in Christ, that that we want to help. In fact, we started our conversation before uh, we began recording on, I can't even imagine. And your response was, I I hope you don't have to. And so for those of us who are watching the tragedy unfold and wanting to help, wanting to pour our hearts out, 
Um, and, and we know obviously prayer is the first thing we need to be doing. And we'll get back to that in a moment, but what are some practical ways right now that we can help in an effective way, in a way that's meaningful to you and the folks in the, in Ukraine? Yeah. Um, when we've lost our homes and we've lost our lives that we had, uh, my son is in Kiev. He's a part of uh, territorial defense in Kiev. He's he's in the very midst of hell that's happening. And the, you know the, you understand that Putin's goal number one is to take the city where my son is. So when I wake up in the morning and send him a message and seeing that my, my message is delivered makes me incredibly happy. And when I see a little plus sign that he sends me back makes me happier than anything in this world. So when so the, the reason why I'm telling you this, I'm 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 trying to show you my context where I am. And so right now, and, and then imagine people from America, from other countries, send me uh, they send me a message and they say, Oleg, we're so sorry, we feel so you know horrible about what happened, we're gonna pray for you. Um, in th- you know what's interesting is that those messages are extremely offensive to me. Because and the reason why is because and and I, I to to the point where I was probably in the midst of all the emotions in the midst of everything that has been happening, um, you know I, I probably offended quite a few people. But my question, well, okay, um, well you are you are sorry, but what have you done? Yeah. And and there are so many bazillion different ways how people and that's what you know people complain to me about Biden and people complain to me about government being slow. And I'm like, you know what? Like, don't pour, don't. I'm I'm already emotionally to yeah. the you know on the edge. Do not do not involve me in your emotional games about your government and how unhappy you are because there are bazillion ways how you can help. And yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, God gave us hands as we remember from Little like Jesus. God gave us head. And all of that can be used. So um, one of the things that we've also learned about many, many Christians, and I did see this change. I did see that rhetoric change. And actually, people got involved with it. This is what we should never forget. You know, there is vision, there is implementation. Yeah. And, and to, me, to me, those two things have to work, faith and work have to go together. Yeah. Um, and so like, have you, you know, here, here's a very, here's a very uh, thing, Ukraine, Ukrainian army has just been stellar. They've shown courage and they've shown um, mastership that nobody, I mean, like, like I didn't, I, I being, me being Ukrainian could have not imagined how strong our army is, you know, yeah. with, with American support. With British support, of course, all of us admit that without even my mom, who was not pro Western recently admitted if America hadn't given us, you know, weapons or Brits, you know, we would this, you know, it'd be it'd be three days like Putin. So, you know, my questions would be okay, you you see, you, you really like you you can get people can get involved politically, people yeah. can write, if you don't like your government, write to your government. You know, don't don't just complain about your government. You can contact them and say, close the sky over Ukraine. You can write and say, Ukraine needs weapons provide. Ukraine needs those planes from Poland. I mean, people, you know, somehow Christians have lost that companion spirit, you know, and, and that's just that's that's very, very um, uh, somehow the church has also been persuaded that uh, and per- the church around the world has been persuaded that it needs to stay within the. Uh, within the walls of the church. Interestingly yeah. enough, and do and 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 mind your business there. Do evangelism, do Bible studies, pray. Oh, you can pray as much as you want, as long as you stay in the area that's assigned to you. That's called the church. Interestingly enough, that's what exactly what Soviet government did in Soviet in seventy years in uh, of of Soviet Union. You know that that's the, for seventy years they tried to persuade the church here that they, the church needs to stay within the church. And I'm like, no, 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 you need to go out. You need to contact your government. Yeah. So that's one of the easiest way how you can help. And another thing is, you know, look at all the companies that are making bloody money. You know, they, by working in Russia, they're paying taxes. Therefore, Russia has more money. I mean, over a thousand missiles have been shot at residential buildings and, uh, and other objects in Ukraine. You know, that can be stopped. And, and so those companies can be stopped and it doesn't hurt to write to Nestle and say that Nestle just made a big statement today that they're not going to leave Russia. 
Nestle that that has a I think they have a uh, a plant near a Atlanta uh, in Peachtree, not in Peachtree City, somewhere on the way south of Atlanta. They have a plant. You know, people need to be kind. Same thing with loop oil uh, gas stations. You know, we can we can boycott them, and 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 I think Christians have learned to be so tolerant to the point mm -hmm. that Christians are useless, except. We're gonna pray for you, which which really means not the, the words we're gonna pray for you mean nothing if there's no action attached. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, I think I think under normal conditions a year ago I would have not been so radical and I was like oh yeah prayer means a lot but prayer yeah. without actions doesn't to us it's offensive to hear those words we're gonna pray for you and not gonna do anything basically because we're gonna pray for you and not gonna do anything and that's yeah. what's offensive. So, so contacting political uh, bodies, contacting co corporations and boycotting co corporations is a big thing that Christians can do without leaving their house, without giving any money, without just sitting on, you know, on your sofa with your computer. The second side, of course, is, um, is helping refugees and helping, uh, helping with uh, providing food for people who stayed in Ukraine. Uh, we've, been, we've been raising money. People have been extremely generous um, on our website, Spirit of Victory, you can see how you can feed a person for a week. You can buy mm -hmm. um, a van of food that can feed uh, 160 people, or you can feed 1,690 people. And one of the most humbling experiences to me in this journey was when I, when I, when I, when we calculated that $71,000 can feed only 1,600 over 1,600 people a week. That was just such a shocking because $71,000 is so much money. And yet it's going to feed such a small group of people. And that kind of tells you uh, the vastness of, uh, of needs that we're dealing with. And so there are so many different ways how people can be involved. One thing that also people need to be, people need to have, turn their brain. And, and be, before people collect clothes and send them to Ukraine, people need to ask people locally, do you need clothes? You know, mm -hmm. and, that, and this is something that's been happening. People are happy to donate, but it's, it's, it's about being strategic. And so, that for, for instance, like for at, this, at this very point, we're not buying any food in Europe. Why? Because there is food in Ukraine. Why would we go to Europe and spend more money? God is calling us to be good stewards. And I think that's as people approach, uh, as people approach donations uh, in particular, people need, to, people need to think, how can we be the best stewards in, in mm -hmm. spending this money? Again, as I'm sharing these things, Probably six hours from now, things may change with, with our needs and, and, and we would need to react. That's why it's so hard for us to plan, you know, we live day by day. So, so I've been following you, obviously. And, and if my son had to worry about his life and I had to worry about his life on a daily basis, I would be wanting people to come to action as well. And so uh, one thing that, that I think is important is that we direct people where they can give now, not through us, not through other channels, but the most direct way possible. So I'm going to ask you that question again. And so it's spirit of victory is your website and we'll post that. Uh, but is that the best way people can give? Yes. Spirit of victory is not, um, is not my, uh, is not my ministry's thing. I'm, I'm a part of a, of an alliance of different ministries that came together of different individuals uh, we sent our wives uh, to uh, to Europe and our children to Europe to be safe. And men stayed here, and and we do what we can do. We take care of the refugees. And I live in a house. I mean, you you can see, you know, we have we have few beds here on the floor, and I don't have a door. And we've been living here for for a while. And this is this is our office, and this is our action center. So Oleg, you've talked to us about your son. Tell us about Lena. Tell us about the rest of your family and 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 the people that are part of your ministry. What are their where are they at now? What are the conditions like? So we have um, we have over twenty people on staff. Twenty. Uh, that's with children. That would be over twenty. We have uh, we have we have twenty people on our staff. And when America started hybrid war a week prior to the real action, before you know Putin started bombing Ukraine. Our, most of people who are on our staff are women. And you could just see that pressure, you know, I mean, every day they come to work and, you know, and I mean, they're, they're women and it's hard for them. Not that women are more emotional than men, but just, it was hard on girls. And so Len and I decided, uh, we listened to our friend from America who said, hey guys, why don't you 
why don't you go to Budapest for a week, for instance, and if nothing happens, you had a great retreat. I'm gonna I'm gonna sponsor that. But if something happens, you save your team, and we're like, oh no, no action is gonna. I mean, Putin can be that you know that mad to bomb Kiev. Something's gonna happen in eastern Ukraine, but not in Kiev. And and he said, well, what if something happens? What are you gonna do? He said, uh, I said, well, we're gonna get on the road and drive. He said, what with with another 15 million people, and and I'm like. Uh, you know, don't worry about that kind of stuff. But one thing that we did as a result of that, we rented a hotel on the border with Slovakia for 20 beds. And, and, and just, just as a more of a, pre, not a precaution, but as a, as a kind of pacifying tool for our staff. So we came to, my wife and I came to our office and we said, hey girls, if anything happens, we have 20 beds, you know, at a hotel in Western Ukraine. And I could see how that just pressure went down and they were fine. Well, Four, at 5 a.m. in the morning, I woke up to the sounds of artillery working in Kiev, and mm -hmm. I woke my wife up and I said, Lena, it started. It started. We have to, we have to run. And um, I asked my uh, wife and my son, uh, who, who's also part of our ministry, to cross the bridges because I imagine that bridges is something that Russia was going to bomb first of all. So, and then, and then I stayed on the on our part of the city to collect our staff. So we collected in the next five hours after they started bombing. Uh, I was collecting, and my wife and and my son were collecting all of our staff uh, around city. And finally, we were able to leave. And another thing. Uh, as we were driving west, we we're trying not to go too much to the north because there was a, a danger of being attacked from Belarus from the north, but also not too much to the south because a danger that we would have been attacked from Crimea. And so we're trying to go in the middle on all these different roads through the woods and, and with, with a team of women and children and a bunch of people. And um, so we came to Western Ukraine and, and I just saw that flood of people coming here, just, you know, hundreds of thousands of people coming to Western Ukraine. And, and my whole, when I brought them to this hotel, my, my whole team, they were crying and they're like, we're cowards. We betrayed our people. We have to go back to Kiev. Yeah. And, and my wife and I are like, you know what? We need to think ahead Let's get everybody out of Ukraine because there are going to be more people coming here. We do have partners in Europe that we, who we can stay with. You know, but there are people coming here with nothing. They're coming with a plastic bag where they have rubber sandals and T-shirt, and that's all they're coming. So, so I say, we, you know, it's it is not being selfish to leave bed here for somebody even though you want to go back to kiev even though you don't want to leave the country it is actually selfish it's not it is actually a very sacrificial thing to to go west and and to stay there giving somebody an opportunity to live here in western ukraine as they evacuate and so basically next morning so my wife who, who my wife my wife her her daily driving is two miles from home to office and store you know, and here she drove for, and my son, who, who is a young driver, they drove for, we drew, all of us drove for 36 hours through the woods to get to Western wow. Ukraine. And then we spent 34 hours in a line to get out of Ukraine. They crossed the border to, uh, to Slovakia. And then she spent another 30 something hours driving from Slovakia to Warsaw in Poland. And so that's, you know, they made that trip. They're there. And so imagine a group, we have a group of um, 13 adults and four little young kids, and they're all traumatized. They left, their, they left their pets at home. They left their parents at home. Some of them left their parents at home. They left their friends at home. They left their life at home. So a group of traumatized women. And also we have, we have teachers. We, have, we run online school. Uh, for children, for, teen, for um, teenagers. And so despite that trauma, uh, they were able to, you know, to pull themselves together. And next day in Poland, they were able to launch online classes and they were able to launch Unity classes. So our school mm -hmm. went from 277 students students to um 3400 i'm not sure what the number and it, it just keeps keeps counting uh and so we've been providing unity lessons for the kids where they can just come for free and socialize and we have students from yeah. occupied territories who joined us who live who are who st who've been staying in the uh in the bomb shelters and they just need a little normality in in this whole abnormality of life that's going on and that's what our school has been providing for those kids wow that's amazing so from so traumatized, so traumatized people were providing ministry to traumatized kids, and it's possible. So what I'm hearing you say, Oleg, is the way we should be, help is both and. 
It's both prayer and action. And the action part is lending our voice to influencers. The action point is using our purchasing power. The action point is helping to give to the refugees and those that are hurting right now. And also our responsibility is to make sure that we're meeting the actual need and not just something we think would be nice to give to, but something that's effective. And yeah, so- very, And one of the things that, one of the things that I, that I would like to share, because it does have, it does have to do with also using, using uh, people's voice. Um, I have, since, since, uh, since mid 2000, I've been to Russia multiple times. I ran so many different training events. In fact, I did lead like Jesus there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and guess what? Out of a hundreds people that we trained there, one person contacted me and asked me how we were doing. Mm -hmm. And then a week later, another person contacted me and he said, Oleg, I'm sitting here at home crying. I have no idea what's going on with me. How can I, how can I send some money to you guys to support out of hundreds of people? Those are only two people who contacted me and one basically said, how are you, how we're doing? And the second, the second has done what a true Christian should have done, apologized. And so it just, to me, that's something that's kind of this enigma of how people are brainwashed and hypnotized, how you can be a Christian, how you can, you know, uh, be, th go through all the training and yet be so, you know, deceived not to, not to be able to, you know, differentiate uh, good from bad. And, and that, to me, that, I think that was, that was, that is still one of the most depressing, um, depressing things. And guess what happened next? People started writing like people from England and people from the United States who mm -hmm. did work in Russia, you know, they started writing, uh, posting messages about this, you know, c conflict in Ukraine, which is not a conflict. It's a, it's a full scale war. It's an invasion. You know, it's wrong. And so I tagged them and I asked them, have you contacted your partners in, U in, in Russia? And nobody responded about that either. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like church, church, likes to be comfortable you know church it, it's it be, because to me one of the things richard that happened in my life big change that happened in my life war stopped being political war mm -hmm. became personal and once war became becomes personal your behavior changes as a result your walk with the lord changes as a, as a result of that and so un unless it hits you and so I, I just really hope this nothing like this happens to you but mm. i think i think we as a church need to see any kind of conflict around the world as something being personal because that's what it is to us on the ground personally yeah um, so as we think about our lead like Jesus family, uh, many of us have different channels and are perhaps giving through our churches or denominations. Uh, there are a lot of nonprofits that are trying to help in ways they can. At lead like Jesus, Oleg, you are one of us. You are one of the lead like Jesus family of tens of thousands of leaders all over the world. And so if, if, if you as a leader, as part of the Lead Like Jesus Network, um, and I'm talking to our listeners now, if you'd like to give, we want to make a way for you to give directly to, to Oleg and the churches that he's working with that are supporting the Ukrainians right where he's at. And that, that, site, that site and opportunity will be made available for you here. And we're going to continue to post uh, words from Ola, Oleg updates, as well as this podcast on our devotions weekly uh, that go out to, again, tens of thousands of leaders all over. So if you want to help somebody in the Lead Like Jesus Network right now, you can help Oleg right where he's at as he's being the hands and feet of Jesus to the people that are all around him suffering in the moment. And so we also know the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so we don't want to make that you know, our, our last resort. It needs to be our first line of, of defense as we're becoming active through that prayer and doing something tangible. So what can we be praying for specifically, Oleg, right now? My son, every morning, I want to get the plus from him. And I just want to see just a cloud of angels over him every morning and every day as, uh, uh, I mean, one of the mornings, uh, one of the missiles hit a, a, a nearby street near his house where he is staying in a basement. So definitely my son, uh, definitely uh, his, his name's uh, Alexi and he's my firstborn. Um, 
and uh, pray for pray for my girls, my team that is gonna. We are relocating them to Spain, uh, further away from the border. Uh, again, just to be on the safe side because it is just unpredictable what Putin's gonna do, even in Poland. Uh, it, it seems to be so. It, it seems to be so crazy to think that he's gonna bomb NATO, but I think there's nothing that that can stop him. Uh, so. Um, so that, you know, pr pray for their safety as, the, as they're relocating. And also in Ukraine, uh, pray, that, um, pray that churches would be able to save people both physically by providing food and also, and also spiritually. And um, one of the things that I do want to say also is I'm so thankful to uh, Lead Like Jesus family because when I, I remember when war started, I sent a message to Lead Like Jesus and I asked you guys to pray. And, and um, quite a few people from Lead Like Jesus executive team from Africa and from Asia did write back to me and did respond and did say that they worried about, you know, about us and what's going on and we we're praying for. So I do, uh, I am thankful for that support from Lead Like Jesus global family. Any final words that you'd like for our audience to know or to be thinking about? Prayer is something that leads to action. And if prayer does not trigger action in our hearts, then it's like a lecture. And Christians need to remember the power of prayer. And if prayer is not driving you to action, then, you know, there's something different that we need to be praying about or, or, or something else that, or maybe we don't, or maybe we don't want to hear that answer. So, you know, I do call people to prayer for you, uh, to pray for Ukraine and, and just, just be very, very, be very open to God telling, telling you what to do in the midst of a situation like this. So I think the time is appropriate now. Let's let's pray. Bow your head with me, brother. Those of you that are watching now, bow your heads and let's pray for Ukraine. Heavenly Father, God of glory, you truly are our rock, our redeemer, our deliverer. I pray that, pray that you'd watch over Oleg at this very moment. Be with him, bless him, keep him safe, provide for him, provide for the people around him his fellow countrymen and women. I pray that you'd watch over Lena. I pray that you'd watch over the ministry team, the team of, uh, of Oleg and Lena's that are out there ministering to, to those who are being oppressed at this very moment. I pray that you'd keep them safe. I pray that you'd meet their every need. I pray that you'd watch over Alexi, keep him safe, Lord God. Please guard him and protect him and guide him. And I pray for peace. I pray that this, this, this war would come to an end even immediately. And I also pray for our, our audience around the world, Lord God, that you'd continue to convict our hearts, that we would obviously be in prayer, fervent prayer, but also prayer that leads us to act, act in a way that's tangible and effective and powerful to come alongside our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray these things in your mighty, precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, brother. And we want to thank you for watching this, this very important message about Ukraine and Lead Like Jesus. And for any more information on the, on the topic, please look for our devotionals that will be going out with updates from Oleg and the team. And you can also go to leadlikejesus.com and find more ways that you can help and get involved. Goodbye for now. Thanks for listening to Leadership Starts on the Inside, a Lead Like Jesus podcast. Learn more and get access to other resources at leadlikejesus.com.